After the death of his father Philip II of Macedon, Alexander set his sights on the Persian Empire seeking revenge, or so he claimed, for the invasion of his homeland by Darius I and Xerxes during the Persian Wars. The campaign began in the early spring of 334 BC. Alexander had assembled his invasion army in Macedonia over the previous winter. It totaled 32,000 foot and approximately 5,000 cavalry, and, when it joined with the advance force operating in Asia, the entire complement was close to 50,000. Upon stabilizing rebellious conditions among the various Greek city-states, he crossed the Hellespont and traveled along the northern coast of Anatolia avoiding the mountain ranges of the northern uplands to the site of ancient Troy. While Alexander and his men were at Troy, the Persians held a council of local satraps to discuss the arrival of the young Macedonian and possible strategies to defend against him. The fundamental issue was whether to risk everything in a single pitched battle, and, given the relative strengths of the two armies, it was no easy decision. Memnon, a high-ranking Greek mercenary loyal to Darius, suggested applying a burned earth policy, to destroy crops, farms, and villages, depriving Alexander of any possible provisions. The local satraps rejected the idea in part because Memnon was Greek but also because they did not want their lands destroyed. They, of course, considered Persian warfare superior to the tactics of invading Greeks. The council decided to put the arriving Macedonians on the defensive by gathering their combined forces and wait for Alexander at the river Granicus. The Granicus was roughly 60 feet wide with both a fast current and steep embankments, what they thought to be, an advantage for themselves. After receiving word from his scouts of the Persians' location at Granicus, Alexander advanced towards the river, he had come to realize that he must defeat the Persians to gain the necessary resources to continue on his quest of conquering Persia. As the Macedonian forces neared the river, Parmenion, one of Alexander's most loyal generals and commander of his left flank, advised Alexander they should wait until morning before attacking. Alexander replied, according to Plutarch, that it would disgrace the Hellespont should he fear the Granicus. The historian Arian spoke of this encounter by saying that Alexander realized that the Persians did not fear him because they did not know him. Alexander rejected Parmenian's plea, the battle would begin that afternoon but would last barely an hour. This is a fine day for battle. Every day is a fine day for battle when you lead men of your stripe. So we shall have victory today, men. By the gods, I feel it in my water. The Macedonian army consisted mostly of infantry. The heavy infantry numbered 12,000 and included a smaller group of elite hypaspists. The light infantry totaled 1,000 and contained archers and elite Agrianian javelin men. The heavy cavalry was made up of 1,800 elite companion cavalry, 1,800 Thessalian cavalry and 600 Greek allied cavalry. The light cavalry numbered 900 in total and was composed of Prodromoi, Peonians, and Thracians. Alexander also possessed Greek allied and mercenary infantry, but he had marched to the Granicus without them. In total, Alexander's army numbered 12,000 heavy infantry, 1,000 light infantry and 5,100 cavalry for a total of 18,100 men. For the Persian army, Arian gives a number of almost 20,000 infantry, all Greek mercenaries, and 20,000 cavalry. Diodorus gives a figure of 10,000 cavalry and 100,000 infantry. Justin gives an even higher number of 600,000 men in total for the Persians. The historian Azar Ged explains that although the Persian Empire and its armies were large, the size of its armies were wildly exaggerated in the Greek sources. Gat adds that this was an invariable habit of pre-modern writers, as they both lacked precise information and were patriotically biased. Although numbers vary among the various ancient sources, modern accounts number the Persians at 10,000 cavalry and 5,000 Greek mercenary infantry.
The Persian strategy was obviously designed to take maximum advantage of the river's disruptive effect, but how they actually deployed their forces is a deep mystery. Arian represents the entire Persian cavalry deployed along the edge of the river with the infantry stationed behind on high ground, which can only have been the range of foothills 1.5 kilometers east of the river. That, as has often been observed, was a military absurdity, the cavalry separated from the infantry and placed in a position where their advantage was totally wasted. The Persian cavalry could neither move forward because of the river banks nor pull back because of the location of the infantry. In addition, the one weapon unique to the Persians, the scythe chariot, was almost useless on the muddy riverbank. For a brief moment, both armies stood across from each other in silence. Alexander had lined his forces on the western banks of the river, Parmenian commanded the left with the Thessalian, Greek and Thracian cavalry, while Alexander, his companion cavalry forces, and light troops stationed themselves on the far right. The Hypaspists and Phalanx battalions stationed in the center. While the crossing in progress, Arcides scouts gave the alarm. Several regiments of cavalry hastily galloped down to the ford, hoping to catch Alexander's troops at a disadvantage. But this time they were too late. The bulk of the army was already on the eastern bank, and Macedonian discipline had no difficulty in coping with a surprise attack of this sort. Their mission was to get as far as possible from the bank and stem the initial charge of the Persian cavalry, so allowing the rest of the right wing to filter across the stream. As they crossed, Alexander brought the rest of the companions into motion, following up the access slope. At first the action favored the Persians. The Macedonian vanguard was hopelessly outnumbered and faced the flower of the enemy cavalry, including Memnon and his sons. It was badly mauled and forced back towards the river. But it had achieved its main task. The momentum of the Persian charge was absorbed and there was free ground for Alexander to make a countercharge. This he did in typically brilliant fashion, leading the assault himself and plunging into the most reckless hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Macedonian cavalry continued to push forward, slowly but surely gaining ground. The Persians were beginning to falter, their ranks thinning as they fell one by one to the Macedonian onslaught. Meanwhile Parmenian, away on the left flank, was fighting a holding action against the Medes and Bactrians. Alexander was making a classic pivotal or echelon attack, with his left wing, as usual, forming the axis. When the Persian right moved forward against Parmenian, with the intention of outflanking him, a gap opened in their center, and it was here that Alexander and the companion cavalry punched their way through. Suddenly, the sound of trumpets pierced the air, signaling the arrival of the Persian reserves. The fresh troops charged into battle, but the Macedonians were ready. This secondary charge, led by a son-in-law of the Persian king, Mithridates, was directed at Alexander, and the young king was assailed from several quarters. The two armies clashed again, with the Macedonian cavalry fighting fiercely against the Persian reinforcements. It was a brutal and bloody battle, with neither side giving an inch. The king himself was in the thick of the fighting, blows showered on his shield and body armor from all sides. A desperate and truly Homeric struggle now ensued. Alexander's spear had been broken in the first onslaught, and old Demaratus of Corinth gave him his own. The king wheeled round and rode straight for Mithridates. The Persian hurled a javelin at him with such force that it not only transfixed his shield, but pierced the cuirass behind it. Alexander plucked out the javelin, set spurs to his horse, and drove his own spear fair and square into Mithridate's breastplate. At this, says Diodorus, adjacent ranks in both armies cried out at the superlative display of prowess. It is all remarkably like a battle scene from the Iliad, which does not necessarily make it suspect testimony. However, the breastplate held, the king's spear point snapped off short, and Mithridates, shaken, but still game, drew his sword in readiness for a close quarters mounted duel. Alexander, with considerable presence of mind, 
jabbed the broken spear into his opponent's face, hurling him to the ground. He was, however, so preoccupied with Mithridates that he had eyes for no one else. Another Persian nobleman, Rosas's, now rode at him from the flank, with drawn saber, and dealt him such a blow on the head that it sheared clean through his winged helmet and laid the scalp open to the bone. Alexander, swaying and dizzy, nevertheless managed to dispatch this fresh assailant, but while he was doing so, Rosas's brother, Spithridates, the satrap of Ionia, moved in behind him, sword upraised, ready to deliver the coup de grace. In the very nick of time, Black Clytus, the brother of Alexander's nurse, severed Spithridate's arm at the shoulder with one tremendous blow. It was none too soon, the king collapsed half fainting to the ground, and a battle royal raged over his prostrate body. Meanwhile the phalanx was pouring through the gap in the Persian center, and had begun to make short work of Arcides' native infantry. Alexander's light-armed troops darted in among the Persian riders, hamstringing their horses and causing general confusion. Somehow the king struggled on to his own horse again, and the companions rallied round him. The enemy center began to cave in, leaving their flanks exposed. Many distinguished Persian commanders had already been killed. This was the beginning of the end. Parmenian's Thessalian cavalry, on the left wing, now made a well-timed charge, and in a moment the entire Persian line broke and fled. Their infantry divisions, except for the mercenaries, put up little resistance. But Memnon and his men retreated in good order to a high knoll above the battlefield, and there made a last stand. They sent a herald to Alexander asking for quarter, but the king was in no mood to grant it. He now concentrated his entire attention on destroying them. While the phalanx delivered a frontal assault, his cavalry hemmed them in from all sides to prevent a mass breakout. Seeing they could expect no mercy, Memnon's troops fought with savage and desperate courage, more Macedonians were killed during this stage of the battle than at any other point. Alexander himself, leading the cavalry, had his horse killed under him by a spear thrust. But there could be only one end to such a struggle. Perhaps three to four thousand mercenaries died where they stood, the remaining two thousand laid down their arms and surrendered. Memnon himself somehow contrived to get away, Alexander had not yet seen the last of him. The rest of Arcides' forces were fleeing in wild disorder across the plain, and Alexander let them go. The Battle of the Granicus was over, and the Captain General had won a famous victory. The 2,000 Greek mercenaries who were captured were sent to Macedon to work the land as slaves. Even though they were Greeks, Alexander felt they had betrayed their fellow Greeks with their service to the Persians. He also sent 300 suits of Persian armor to Athens as a votive offering to Athena on the Acropolis. He ordered an inscription to be fixed over them so as to mark the absence of the Spartans in his united Greek army, Alexander, son of Philip and all the Greeks except the Lacedaemonians, present this offering from the spoils taken from the barbarians inhabiting Asia. The spoils of war, gold and rich cloth, were sent home to Alexander's mother Olympias. To honor all who had died in battle, Alexander buried both Greek and Persians alike. According to adjusted modern accounts, the Persians lost 10 to 20 percent of their forces and two-thirds of their commanders. Sources concerning Alexander are varied, 25 to 30 companions, possibly 120 in total. Back home, statues honoring the 25 fallen companions were erected at the sanctuary of Zeus at Diam near Mount Olympus. The Persians had been demonstrably outmatched, they had lost a large proportion of their effective infantry and were in no position to contest the occupation of Asia Minor by land. That was acknowledged by the senior surviving Persian commander, Arcides, who retired from his satrapy to Greater Phrygia, where he committed suicide, conscious of his responsibility for the disaster. The other commanders who remained alive dispersed, 
Atizis and Arzames to their satrapies of Phrygia and Cilicia and Memnon to the Aegean coast, where the next act in the drama would be played. After Granicus there was little resistance against Alexander and his forces. Soon, however, he would meet the king of Persia himself. In November of 333 BCE, Alexander and Darius would face each other at Issus.